All right, folks, welcome back to Mike Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 123 today. Uh, we're going to be talking about psychedelics and the mind with uh, Susanna Weiss. She is a freelance writer. She's written for Vice, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, I believe Playboy as well. She's She's got her stuff out there everywhere. Uh, I have the link down below the video so you can check out her work. Um, and, but today we're going to be talking about psychedelics and the mind and um, her personal experience with these substances. Uh, so we appreciate you joining us, Suzanne. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. 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 So I read through a few of the articles you've uh, written, and um, you've got a very distinct style. Um, what? How did you get into psychedelics? What was your first experience? And uh, I guess what what psychedelics are you you know do you lean towards when you do them? Um, well, it's shifted throughout the years. My first experience was in 2016 when I was in kind of a dark period of my life. I was severely workaholic, had an eating disorder, and um, someone offered me like just a microdose of Molly at um, EDC Vegas, the music festival. And I had this epiphany there where it was like I realized that all these behaviors, these compulsions I had came ultimately from not feeling good about myself. And just in that moment when I did feel good about myself unconditionally, and I think it also had to do with the community of the music festival, it was like I could see what decisions I would make outside of that low self-esteem. And it um, inspired me to quit a job and travel to Ibiza. And then um, there... <laughs> I had my first like full dose of MDMA and then that inspired me to leave my apartment in New York and travel the world because it was like I could see what limitations in my life were self-imposed. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That started this whole journey um, where and then I got into plant medicine um, about a year later and I did ayahuasca and that was another big awakening where I it was like I met my true nature, my true self, and I saw that behind all this. It was like I had become a robot, that I was just obsessed with achievement and work and money, and that I had this like beautiful, bright energy inside me, and that I was happy at my nature. And um, I soon after that came out with a case of chronic Lyme disease, and plant medicine became my main well, my most effective healing modality, particularly Cambo and Iboga, and Iboga is the one that changed my life completely, caused me to end a relationship um, where I was serially cheating and just be more honest in my life in general. And it like had enormous physical healing, even very physical things like um. I had a knee injury and every time I would do a boga, my knees would be twitching and then they would feel better afterward. And mm -hmm. each time I did it, it also helps with other problems like brain fog, insomnia, low energy. Like every time I did it, I would just feel more and more like myself. And um, I owe like my recovery to a boga more than anything. <clears throat> yeah. Boga, Beautiful. A boga is an interesting one, right? I mean, um, I personally have no experience with it. It's actually one of the few that I haven't done before, but uh, we've talked about it on the show before with people that have done it. Um, and it seems like there's a big difference too between Iboga and Ibogaine, which is what they use to treat people that have severe addiction issues and things like that. Um, have you tried those two separately or have you just uh, ingested the Iboga plant? I'm pretty sure just Iboga. Um, yeah, the TA extract. I think that's Iboga. Mm -hmm. What is that, like a powder? Um, they extract the alkaloids from the Iboga and put it into capsules. Okay. As opposed to like the root bark, which is kind of difficult to ingest. Yeah, I would assume. Yeah, it's used in West Africa, I believe. Um, but, uh, so through you, you mentioned music festivals and it's interesting cause that's kind of how we got into psychedelic culture as well. Um, in the late night, mid to late nineties, we were huge, you know, we're still, but fish fans and that scene kind of promotes 
psychedelic culture somewhat and like the dead and everything. I mean, that was the whole catalyst behind a lot of this uh, modern movement. Um, but you mentioned, you know, going to these, uh, you know, what do you call it now? Techno? I, I don't mean I, EDM. I mean, I'm a musician, but I don't know uh, the different terminology in that within that uh, genre. But uh, w- did you th- feel like those went hand in hand, the music and the psychedelics? Or was that just kind of you were there and that's just an element that's that's part of it? Or what, what do you think? Um, you mean, are you asking if the music contributed to the healing that I No, if the music contributed to introducing you to that whole culture of, you know, psychedelics and this whole other thing, if you will. Yeah, I mean, particularly MDMA, it was first at a music EDM festival, and then it was in Ibiza, where there's all these DJs. Mm -hmm. That's generally a big part of that culture, not so much other psychedelics, though. Yeah, okay. Yeah, MDMA is kind of one of my (laughs) most interesting experiences with MDMA, and actually Maurice as well was at a fish uh, show not that long ago, a few years ago here in Chicago, but... um, so when you look at the effects of psychedelics in the mind, um, have you used it to heal with like a therapist or is it something that you just did on your own? Or, um, I mean, you mentioned healing. I know, you know, when you do an ayahuasca ceremony, you have the uh, curandero, curandera or ayahuascaro or whatever. Uh, but did you take it upon yourself to do this or, is, or did you actually meet with a therapist and then work those issues out in combination with that? I've done all different formats. Uh, in the beginning with MDMA, that was just like in social settings. Mm-hmm. Um, with the ayahuasca and the aboga, that was with shamans. I've also done individual ceremonies. Um, I've done a few mushroom and MDMA ceremonies with, um, I guess you could call them shamans. They they don't call themselves shamans, but they're not therapists either. They're just practitioners. Um yeah, what else? I've done 5-MeO-DMT with sort of a trained practitioner. Um, I've done San Pedro and Cambo in ceremonies. It's been a mixture. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you get more out of it when you have a guide? It depends on the drug, I would say. Like... And how I'm using it. Like lately I've been microdosing mushrooms and just writing and going on walks by myself. And that's been really fruitful for me. Um, In general, I probably... Yeah, if I do a drug that's like either a higher dose or like a more intense drug than generally I would want to be supervised. Yeah. <clears throat> now I actually want to ask you about that. So there's a little bit of like a culture thing too, with use of terms, you say the word drug. I know a lot of people in the community are like, don't use that word. Um, but I don't really care for me I, w- with words. It's like this thing. It's if you're conveying something, um, you know, there's a lot of people, using terminology that's not correct or whatever. But um, at the same time, uh, how do you feel about that whole terminology thing that's, that's you know, people don't like the word drugs? Is Even people, you know, when we talk to people that are UFO researchers and whatever, they don't even like the word UFO anymore because it's kind of... Uh, yeah, the know, stigma that comes Yeah, it's kind it. of a stigma. So, I mean, do you feel like there is a stigma behind, behind the word drug? I mean, you're a writer. Uh, you write about these substances. Uh, technically they are a drug if you, it depends on your category, I guess, or your classification of what you think a drug is, but anything mind altering, I mean, I could say coffee is a drug, but do you feel like, yeah, it is. do you feel like there is a stigma, uh, behind that word or what do you think? Yeah, I do. Um, but I think the insistence on not calling plant medicine drugs contributes to the stigma. Mm. I know in my first ayahuasca retreat, they said like, it's not a drug, it's medicine because drugs take you like outside of yourself. They're an escape. Whereas medicine takes you into yourself and makes you face your demons. Mm -hmm. And Mm. I don't know if I agree with that dichotomy. Like MDMA for me was not an escape. 
most people would consider that a drug. I don't know, on the flip side, you might have like cocaine, but even that can be medicine. Like I... Yeah, they chew coca leaves in South America in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and they use that for hikes. Um, It's almost like the mindset you had before going in. If you're going out on a Friday night and you're going to get all messed up and do coke, it's like it's not really productive to your life. So in that regard, it might be considered more of a drug. That, it might boost your confidence. It might facilitate social relationships. I feel like even alcohol as well can do that. So I just... Even when you're using it socially, I think it can be medicine. Yeah, that's true. I, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, we've had, um, who was it? Oh, it was uh, Joe Moore from Psychedelics Today talking about how, um, you know, even like PCP, for instance, has, even though it has a, a negative stigma behind it, there have been positive studies with it. And there are some researchers and psychologists in the past that have tried to integrate it um but yeah it's it's definitely an interesting conversation to be had for sure um when you've written articles what specifically when you write about psychedelics are you i think i read one but how many have you written about psychedelics or is it just something that when you have an experience you write about it or i don't know how many dozens um yeah often inspired by personal experience sometimes just inspired by Um, sometimes editors go to me with the assignments. Um, some of them are more informational. They're about a general trend or about like a particular effect of psychedelics and the scientific explanation behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it varies. Yeah. We just had, uh, Dr. Rick Strassman on, which was a, an awesome, fun interview to have, um, do you ever study the, the scientific aspects of uh, um, psychedelics and like the effects it has on the mind and then the philosophy of the mind behind it? Um, is that something that you're interested in? Yeah, that's something I've written a few articles about, um, often on specific things. Like I did one on why ayahuasca makes you vomit, one on like why you can't pee on MDMA, just like mm-hmm. scientific explanations behind these weird effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember the non-peeing thing, but maybe I wasn't paying too much attention to that. <laughs> uh, so, out of all of the psychedelics that you've done, is there one experience that stands out as like a transformative experience where after you came down, you really were like, wow, this this is a game changer? Almost all of them, okay. but the most got to be my first Iboga experience. It was, I mean, that was when I was sort of deep in the Lyme disease journey. And I had like a week where I just felt completely healthy in myself. And I remind, I remembered who I was. It was like I was a child again. And I saw that my nature was good. And like all this darkness inside me that like, made me think I was a bad person was taken on from other people. And I just like saw how the universe worked and like saw my soul and like, it was the most spiritual experience I'd ever had. And it was, you know, after that week or so where I was still feeling it, things kind of went back to normal in my life. But like gradually as I did it more, I feel like I've been getting more and more back to that place I was then where I was just my true self, my healthy self and my like unadulterated self. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so when it comes to you, you mentioned spirituality, do you believe in some sort of metaphysical connection with psychedelics? I mean, something we talk a lot about on the show, um, where you would have a dogmatic materialist scientist say, well, these are just, you know, it's that 5-HTP2A receptor playing off the serotonin, and eventually we're going to figure out consciousness, and then we're going to be able to correlate these things. Or do you think that there is some sort of unseen um, metaphysical, con- I mean, we can only perceive 5% of the universe, so do you, do you from your experiences, um, and somebody that is interested in science as well, find that there may be a little bit more to life than what meets the eye? Oh, yeah. 
I think these plants, like I talk to them when I'm not on them. Like I think there's some physical basis even of that, but it's beyond what science can explain right now. Like, I don't know, this is going to sound really woo woo, but I feel like I get signs from these plants when it's time to do them again. Like when it's time for me to do ayahuasca, I always like end up seeing snakes, like not hallucinating. Like actually I'll like see someone on the street with a snake and then like I'll be given the wrong dish at a restaurant and it will taste like ayahuasca and like Mm. then I'll get an email about ayahuasca and yeah and I've developed a relationship where sometimes I can ask Iboga questions um I think that they interfere with our lives in little ways I have this theory Iboga like uses technology to like speak to us um like I'm trying to think of an example after I do Iboga I always experience weird technological mishaps that always like get me into a situation that it feels like the aboga wanted me to be mm. like, um, after my first retreat, I, my phone like suddenly broke and then like, it made me miss a flight. And then I had to stay in Austin. And then I met up with an old friend and like told him about Iboga and then like someone else had told him about it and he was feeling led toward it. Just like, I feel like these plants, once you are part, they're part of your life, they like, they have this spirit that's way beyond. Um, and also what will happen is often before I even take it, I start to feel the effects. Mm-hmm. Like with a boga, I'll get insomnia the night before. And my shaman says that's super common. Um, the masseuse who comes to the aboga retreats I go to says like he will get insomnia, which is an effect of a boga, like just by massaging people on it. Mm-hmm. I feel like it, yeah, it has, it connects with us on an energetic level. That's not quite understood and maybe physical by some definition, but not in a way we understand. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And it's not too woo woo. I mean, we talk about some pretty woo woo things on this show, so oh, not, yeah. not to worry about that, but I, I don't even think a lot of this stuff is woo woo. I just think it's again, metaphysical concepts that are beyond the purview of current science, you know? So, um, but actually, to, to your point, you just mentioned uh, Dr. Strassman, when he was just on, mentions that uh, with these substances, it's almost like a confirmation of the placebo effect. So if you go in with some sort of mindset or intention, it's not saying that there's not something metaphysical going on. It's that, um, what was his example? Uh, during the trials of the spirit molecule, somebody always wanted a, a mystical NDE type experience, and they had it. Another person... Uh, had a shamanic experience that they, you know, kind of had in their mind. So um, maybe these things bring out our inner thoughts and our inner ideas. I know there's some connection possibly to the subconscious as well. Uh, but yeah, these these are definitely interesting concepts. Um, and hopefully science with all the current psychedelic research going uh, on will maybe chip away at that. But um, so you wrote an article about... Uh, taking psilocybin and going to an orgy uh what (laughs) why don't you uh talk about that story a little bit if you will yeah well i started microdosing mushrooms over the summer which i really like it sort of i feel like gets me in touch kind of with a fun playful silly side of myself and um just makes me feel more like myself And, um, yeah, this one time I did it was before I went to a sex party. I had started going to these parties and I was very shy. And so nothing had actually happened for me at them. And then, so I decided I'll microdose mushrooms before one to like try to open me up and something actually did happen at that one. I don't know if it was because of the mushrooms, but, um, then an editor approached me and was like, have you heard of this trend of microdosing mushrooms before first dates? And I was like, no, but I did it at a sex party and, So I took this assignment and then like apparently other people had done it before dates and it helped like open them up and sort of release their inhibitions in a way that was maybe less sloppy than alcohol might have been. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting one to me because anytime I've ever taken a psychedelic, I mean, and I've, since my adult life, I've been in relationships and had girlfriends and now I'm married, but, um, I've never really thought about se- even people. Yeah, say, it's M- almost the least thing. Yeah, in MDMA. Mind. People are touching each other, or sucking on suckers, sucking on you know uh, passies and stuff. But I've never felt that 
thing, whatever that is. It's never been like a sexual thing. It's always been like a mysterious, um, almost like an initiation into the mysteries kind of a thing. Um, where there's something like a cult about it. Uh, but what do you think that is that it, it is connecting to somebody's sexuality or what do you think that connection is? Because I, I know that there are people that, um, feel the same way you do and have had similar experiences. So what do you think that is? I've noticed when a lot of psychedelics, I just feel more in my body, um, with pretty much all of them, with iboga, with ayahuasca. Um, I mean, with those two, I wouldn't have sex on the drug. That's there's too much going on. But like right after, I don't know. I think it just brings you into your body and out of your mind. Hmm. Yeah, again, I, I don't know. Maybe it's, the, again, it's the placebo thing. So going in, I'm looking for that mystery. I'm looking for that, you know, metaphysical. So maybe that's what it is. But, yeah, I've never felt like, oh, man, I got to hook up with a chick on, on this stuff, you know. So I guess it's <laughs> different strokes for different folks, and it all depends on your, you know, your biochemistry and physiology and everything. But um, when you – are you – so you write articles. Have you ever thought about writing a book about your experiences with psychedelics, or is that something maybe down the line? Or That's what I've been doing with the quarantine. I actually just finished a memoir called Tick Medicine mm. about my experience healing Lyme disease with psychedelics, and I have no idea when it will come out, probably years down the line, but my plan is to eventually publish it. Mm. Beautiful. We'll have to get you back on when that comes out. So you mentioned ticks. Actually, two or three years ago, I was cutting my lawn, and I came in, and I had a tick on my arm, and I pulled it out, and I thought nothing of it. Like three or four days later, there was a rash, and I'm like, oh, shit. I go to the doctor. He gives me the antibiotics. He says I should be fine, and I haven't really had any issues. Um, I haven't also been tested for it either, but there's this weird thing. I know some hospitals – and some uh, medical um, organizations don't even recognize Lyme disease as a real disease because there's not like one thing that they can point to to say this is it or this is it. It's like a whole entourage of things that happen within the body. Um, and um, so what, do you, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, and have you actually had your blood taken and have they, they said that this is Lyme's disease? There is a lot of debate about chronic Lyme disease, like acute Lyme, what you had with the rash and whatnot, and you just got it. That's pretty easy to diagnose. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't even think that chronic Lyme exists. I personally believe that as someone who's been through it, it was really the only diagnosis that explained what was happening to me. I did... Um, the thing with the typical tests, and some doctors will debate this, but um, many Lyme doctors believe that they do not, these tests miss a lot of infections. And there are some alternative tests which did um, find like positive results for me. Um, although there's debate over the meaning of those tests, like they can show you're carrying the bacteria, but a lot of people are and they don't have it. Right. So, um, yeah, there's really a lot of debate, and some people suggest that it has to do with chronic Lyme for some reason affecting women more often because women's health issues are traditionally taken less seriously. Um, so yeah, and Lyme disease, especially chronic Lyme, can show up in many, many different ways because there's co-infections. There's, it's really about like it's caused by these main bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, but they also do all these other things. They suppress your immune system. They cause other bacteria already living in your body to have to sort of come out of latency. And so the cases manifest differently in many people. So it's very hard. It's a controversial diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go to a functional medicine doctor to get diagnosed right. and there are probably some people who think I'm full of shit and maybe it's in my head or whatever, but no, I mean, so I, you know, was that Dr. Mark Hyman? He's functional. I know a lot of people. Um, and even my aunt who runs uh, a dental practice, they all, they do functional medicine there. I mean, there's definitely like the teeth are a gateway to your body. So some of these systems in your body definitely influence the rest of your body. And I don't know how that's not accepted in modern science. Uh, but 
you mentioned the the tick uh, or the um, the chronic Lyme being more uh, detrimental to women. Do you think that there's ever been? Do you think it could be some sort of like um, catalyst that maybe? Because I know women are more susceptible to multiple sclerosis or MS and like lupus and things like that. Do you think that maybe this is triggering something like that, and maybe they just haven't done enough studies, or do you think that's a possibility? I just read a book about this. It's called The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness by Sarah Ramey. What she suggests is that um, what these illnesses have in common is that they have an autoimmune component. Mm -hmm. And she suggests that it has to do with women um, with our guts in particular being more sensitive. And I can't be that specific about the research and whatnot, but I think women's immune systems may work slightly differently, and I think that may be the common thread. Mm. Yeah, I know that even with everything going on uh, out there right now, there's been some suggestions, too, that uh, maybe women are a little bit more immune because of the way that their immune system works, too. So we definitely live in uh, interesting times where um, there's a lot of information one way and then it swings back the other way. And that's just how science goes. Right. One minute, one thing's right. And the next minute it's wrong. And then it's a common theme exactly. we talk about on here. Uh, what I'm saying right now might sound right to people or or not. Uh, but in a thousand years, we're all going to sound like idiots. So it, you know, it's one of those things where we're just pushing this uh, ball, you know, moving it down the uh, field and the next people are going to pick it up and do what they can with it. But, um, What's the thing that fascinates you most about the effects of psychedelics on the mind and um, some sort of connection to something greater? Uh, it's just that, that for me, they really, um, I had always been kind of a spiritual person, but it's through psychedelics that I was like, there is something greater and I don't quite understand it, but there's just no way that these plants the intricate ways they work and how they can do something so specific. Like they can know like this person's knees are injured and I'm going to like work on their knees. It's just so sophisticated. It makes me feel like there is some intelligence behind it. Hmm. Um, and just for me, they've connected me to this spiritual, especially a boga just connected me to this spiritual realm and just left no doubt in my mind that, like, I don't know, God, like, not in the sense of, like, a man in the sky, but, like, mm -hmm. just this collective consciousness that we all have and that we can use to manifest um, and this creative force that we're all co-creating the world together, that it exists because it's like I've been there, I've been to that realm, and that's given my whole life much more meaning. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel you on the, I mean, we don't, I was raised Catholic, but the idea of some Zeus looking character sitting on a throne in the clouds, it just seems a little absurd with what we know. Um, but this idea of maybe like a Eastern philosophy, you know, like the web of Indra, if you know what that is, this connectedness of the universe that we're all um, connected with some sort of primordial energy or something, whether it's light or... Um, you know, particles of some sort, you know, I definitely can get on board with that. And we've talked about that a lot on this podcast before. Um, do you think that um, looking back, do you regret any of the psychedelics? Not, not re necessarily regret, but do you look back and think uh, maybe I won't do that one again or had an experience where it's like, ah, that one, one time was enough. There is no drug that I would not do again. There, in the beginning, I was irresponsible with MDMA use because I was living in Germany for a while and they just, like my friends there, would just be taking it at clubs all the time. And I realized that to get the most out of that, I need to reserve that for like a few times a year and be really deliberate. I don't like the club environment. I like some place where I can write and or talk. Um, and also when you do that too much, like you need more to feel the effects and that can be right. dangerous. So that's, that's really the only thing that I, I wouldn't say regret. I always got something out of it, but that I could have 
probably use more responsibly. Sure. I mean, I think that, that when you're young, we all kind of do that. I don't think there's a young person that's like, I'm going to use this as a tool and further my, you know, expand this expansion of my mind and think about the universe. I, I mean, when you're young, you're thinking about, uh, you know, how am I going to hook up with this person or how am I going to, uh, you know, get through college or whatever. There's a lot of other things going on and you think you have all the time in the world. So you're not thinking about some, you know, epistemology, ontology, teleology, those kinds of things. But um, what if you were to um, write an article um, based on what you know about psychedelics, you know, and helping people, you said you had depression and what would you focus on in terms of being the catalyst for that? Is it, is it specifically the psychoactive active compounds? Do you think it's the introspection um, in combination with the compounds or, or what do you think is going on there that ultimately helped you and possibly other people? <sighs> I, um, I'm not sure. Could you rephrase that question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it just, when you've done, when you've had your experiences with the psychoactive compounds, um, do you think it was directly, do you think it's specifically the psychoactive compounds that are helping you heal? Or do you think it's a combination of the compounds mixed with some sort of therapy or introspection or meditation, something where you're, you're getting in your own mind and you're trying to like un unravel what's going on? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it has to be in conjunction with therapy or anything. Like I've heard of really therapeutic experiences, just taking MDMA at a rave, for example. Um, but the way I've gotten most out of these substances, it depends on the substance. Um, but I would say in general to like be in an environment where I can either talk through my problems with others. It doesn't have to be like a professional necessarily, although that can be fruitful. Um, and or write, although like, I think I'm weird in that I can like write on these drugs. I think that's probably unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think Dimitri Mugianis, who I worked with, with Iboga, um, he sort of has this hybrid model that I really like. He is trained by the Buiti tribe in Africa and he brings those traditions, but he also brings in doctors and he's really non-pretentious about it. Like if you are experiencing insomnia as an after effect he will like offer you like a valium or something which is like really frowned upon but he believes in this hybrid and yeah i remember the first time i did it with him i like took this anti-nausea medication beforehand which the buiti would say like i was being a wimp but he was like who cares and so then i had like a much more pleasant experience because i wasn't so nauseous during it mm -hmm. yeah um, like the doctor and nurses were like shaking rattles around me. And I think there's something really beautiful about bringing those Eastern and West or not necessarily Eastern, those traditional and more modern perspectives together. Mm -hmm. do, you do you prepare yourself before you partake with the medicine? Like do you write down goals or problems you're having and try and focus on those? Yeah, usually um, the practitioner most practitioners will like arrange a call or two with you beforehand to talk about okay. your intentions and your goals. Yeah. The, the reason why I asked that before though was, uh, I mean, I have clinical OCD and depression that's been really bad at certain times in my life, um, starting in my mid twenties. Uh, but I've had really good, um, I've had really good results with macro dosing psilocybin uh, on its own, but then to take it to the next level, when I started to incorporate CBT therapy, um, it was almost like the psilocybin was allowing me to take, uh, this is what I would say OCD is like. It's almost like a tangled ball of wool in your mind and you're kind of feeding it through the different things and retracing your steps and trying to, um, you know, untangle this mess of thinking that you've gotten yourself in. I don't know. Uh, I've talked about this before. If, if it, you know, I know most scientists or uh, psychiatrists or whatever say it's a chemical imbalance. I think it's a thinking pattern thing where you get into these thinking patterns and you start to obsess. And I think we're all obsessive to 
a certain degree, whether it's TV or eating or uh, drugs or whatever, we're all addicted to something, right? So uh, I, my, my theory is that you just get latched onto this idea or this neuroses and it just keeps manifesting and you keep feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. So um, yeah, I've had really good uh, results with being able to, t you know, the, the psilocybin allows you to t kind of take a look outside yourself and unravel that. That's just my opinion, though, but uh, that's why I was asking you. So uh, I know we don't have much time left, um, but what... I just pulled my next call. I'm going to be a little late. So. Oh, oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, what do you think um, in terms of so you mentioned taking psilocybin and going to that sex party. Um, do you think though that maybe that's, you know, a little risky in certain scenarios? Cause I know I, anytime you get out of your comfort zone or normal consciousness, you know, other things, you know, not necessarily good things, uh, can result. And I know there's obviously a culture, um, where there's good, curandero curanderos ayahuascaros shamans and they just want to help you but then there's also people that take advantage too and i know that that's been um, discussed a lot within the psychedelic community of, of recent because there is a lot of tourism going on so uh, what are your thoughts on that yeah i just did an article about um like sexual assault within the psychedelic community and it seems to be a very big problem um I would say, yeah, there is a risk of that to like be conscious of to try to get recommendations from people as to what retreats to go on. Um, I discussed this with Dimitri, one of the people I work with. He like he always has like a female assistant with him, and though um, women can be the abusers, he thinks that at least makes it more safe if you go somewhere where there's at least like one woman in charge. Um, and if you're running them to at least like involve women in the process. Um, yeah, in terms of, I mean, you need to know yourself, I guess, in terms of like social, socially doing it, just mm -hmm. um, be conscious of who you're doing it with, know your own limits. Like for me, I feel like microdosing mushrooms. I still feel like I have a handle on myself. I don't feel like I, Cannot yeah, you've got one foot in reality for sure. Um, I mean, definitely no more so than alcohol, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. In sexual scenarios, I mean, if you're actually going to get high, it's always good to like discuss beforehand what you plan to do and not do before you take drugs, because then it gets really fuzzy in terms of consent and whatnot. Yeah, I was just curious um, to hear the. Uh female perspective on that because um, you know we've had obviously women on the show but i'd like to have more um it just seems like uh when you when we talk about these things i think that hearing a man talk about it's obviously different than hearing a woman talk about it because they're the ones that have to deal with the potential uh of that situation occurring um that being the case though um you made a good point. It, you know, it's all about qualifying, right? We, we work on referrals and stuff everywhere else in life. I don't see why that wouldn't be the case with this, where you know somebody or their friends or their friends of friends or that's somewhere where somebody goes regularly. Um, I think maybe if you go as a group too, that's not a, a bad idea uh, to be with people you know and trust, you know, while, you know, some of these things might get intense at times, having more people, to, you know, you know, might not be the worst thing. But um, so what do you when you write what's your writing style do you when you write these articles do you just take an experience and then run with it or um, are you just trying to capture the essence of uh, what the moment was like or what's your process hmm well it depends on the piece my process is generally if I feel inspired if I have an experience I want to write about or like an informational piece I'll like send off a paragraph long pitch to an editor then if it's accepted um I'll like interview a few experts and um then just sort of put the piece together from there um is that what you're asking yeah yeah I was just curious how you get inspired and, and when you start writing what's your your actual you mentioned sometimes you 
microdose and, and start to write. I was just curious if maybe part of it is the microdosing gives you the inspiration and then maybe you go back over it afterwards when you're maybe not under the influence or something like that. The that's not a regular thing for me really. Um, to like microdose before writing. I usually save that for really big projects. Like mm -hmm. this memoir was partly written like on iboga and partly on mushrooms. Um, I also discovered this drug, Kana, which is amazing for writing. It's like completely legal. You could order it off Amazon and it's like MDMA. It's Yeah, awesome. I heard about that actually. I've been reading about that. Yeah, it's amazing. It like it gives you a mild euphoria and you just think much more clearly. And it's not really considered risky. It's like completely legal and frequently used in South Africa. In Europe, they sometimes give it to cats and dogs to like reduce separation anxiety. Mm. And yeah, like last time there's another book proposal I'm working on. And last time I like took some Kana beforehand and I just like zoomed through it and like got all these poetic ideas and yeah, I used to write on MDMA, which was not sustainable. That is much better. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> uh, have you ever heard of the stuff? We were watching, what was I watching with my wife? Oh, we were watching Lilyhammer. It's like a show um, with the guy with, I think it's uh, Syl from Sopranos is like the main character. But um, in there, they're chewing this stuff. It's called Kat. It's like K-H-A-T or Q-A-T. And it's, I guess it's like a stimulant or, or something. I was just curious if you've heard of that. I think it's from Africa. Um, but Sounds like it could be Kana. I mean, that's something they do chew it, I think. Yeah, this is like, again, it's, I looked it up. It is a thing. It's K-H-A-T or Q-A-T. Um, but uh, I was just curious if you'd heard of it because um, I've never heard of it until we were watching them. I'm like, what, are, what is that lady chewing? She's like tripping out afterwards. She was all <laughs> strung out like she had been doing lines all night. Um, I'm picking it up now. It looks like it's something different from Kana. I'm not sure. The World Health Organization classified it as a drug of abuse, so mm. maybe it's not. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so no, that that's interesting. That's why I was just curious because I mean. I'm an artistic person. Maurice is very artistic. I mean, we've been musicians. We do this podcast now. Um, you know, he's in video and editing stuff too, and a photographer, and I do all sorts of sound engineering stuff. Um, so, but my thing is, is always been cannabis. I mean, that's, that's my go-to, uh, you know, cannab cannabis and CBD. And, um, while I do love psychedelics, I think that, um, I don't know what it is about cannabis. It just, it, it, takes you to that artistic place do you use cannabis or is that something you use sparingly or yeah it's funny like I can handle all these like harder drugs and like have always have good experiences but like weed is the one that like I don't always like it like <laughs> yeah. me anxious or paranoid sometimes it does make me kind of inspired it's a weird like you don't know what you're gonna get um, but in general, I just don't like how it kind of, um, the next day it leaves me in a fog. And so, hold on, I have to... <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Man. Bless you. No, no, yeah, that's, that was intense. Yeah, for me, like, edibles, I, I've almost had worse experiences off edibles than mushrooms, more intense, scary experiences. So I, I stay away from edibles altogether at this point. Yeah, edibles. My first experience of really being stoned was on an edible, and it was so disorienting. I was in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, and, like, I got a text from a client telling her I had to, like, share a Google Doc with her, and I just, like, was completely dumbfounded as to how to do that. And then, like, finally I figured it out. Then I, like, walked home and just wanted to, like, lie in bed. But then I got scared because when I first like my blanket was tickling me and then when I closed my eyes, I felt like they were rolling to the back of my head and I got really scared. I'd never like get my eyes back to normal and I kept opening them it was this weird paranoid experience that I would not repeat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super interesting how different uh, compounds interact with different people. I'm the opposite. When I smoke or I take a couple 
drops of some tincture or something. I'm just mellow out, get super creative, do all my editing and, um, you know, imagery and stuff like that. So I don't know. I, I, I guess it's, uh, again, it's di- different. different strokes for different folks, baby. <laughs> Thanks, Maurice. Um, but, uh, if you were to, um, write an article, uh, regarding cannabis, would you write it then in terms of your point of view having to do with your experiences or do you have have people around you where they've had a positive experiences too, where you, so then you would maybe look at it from like a more of an objective view or when you write, how, how does that work? Is it just your point of view? Is it, um, a mixture of the point of your point of view mixed with public perception or how do you write that? Most articles I've written about cannabis have not been from a first person perspective. I've actually written a lot about it. It's funny because like I think people saw me writing about other drugs. So they started assigning me stuff about cannabis. And so most people for their profession, they don't want people to know they smoke weed. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to know I don't smoke weed because I'm writing about it. Right. Um, But yeah, it's usually like I'll interview people about their experiences. I think I've had a few that talked about mine, but in general, like I don't have as much experience with it. Well, it's legal there. You're in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're in LA. It's legal there. I'm in Chicago. It's legal here. And Maurice is in Michigan. It's legal there. So, I mean, it's the tides are turning for sure. And actually, uh, my thought is, is the same thing is going to happen with the psychedelic movement that happened with the cannabis movement. Do you, what do you think about that? To an extent, I mean, there are, I feel like psychedelics in general are like riskier than weed. Um, Yeah. Mushrooms. Yeah. Actually, I saw a study like mushrooms were the least, caused the least problems, like some whatnot. So I think that's, it makes sense that they're the first sort of being destigmatized and legalized. But, um, you know, I think it does make sense that certain drugs have to be regulated because you don't want people like, I don't know, for example, you wouldn't drive like on acid or at least. No, you yeah. I, I meant more maybe see like uh, obviously when cannabis was first uh, coming into the public spotlight, it was more medical. Um, and I think the same thing will happen with psychedelics in the sense that psilocybin, MDMA, uh, possibly DMT and a few others um, maybe will be able to be used via psychiatrist, um, um, psychiatrists or uh, I don't even know, therapists. Some, somebody will have to administer it, like you're saying. I don't think it'll be like, oh, we can just go to the mushroom store. And may, actually, if there is going to be one substance that will have that, it would be, I think, the psil- psilocybin because, as you mentioned, it's – um, maybe they would only give you a certain amount, like a gram or a gram and a half, where in that case, it's not going to really, you know, you'll get there, but it's not going to be do much. So, um, but yeah, that's just my opinion on that. Um, so what, what interests you the most going forward with psychedelics or is it psychedelics mis- mixed with sexuality? Is it psychedelics mixed with philosophy of the mind? Like where, where do you think you're going next with all this stuff? Well, I think something that needs to come to light a little more is like psychedelics effect on physical healing. Um, I experienced that. I know others who have experienced that and there's very little known about it. There are speculations. There are small studies on, for example, iboga being used for things like Parkinson's. And I think for a lot of hard to treat illnesses like chronic Lyme, they could be very promising. So I'd be interested to see more research and writing on that. Yeah, is, is so isn't that part, so the purge or the ayahuasca um isn't that the part of that why they you know you change your diet and um you prepare yourself for it um because the reason why they call it the purge is you're purging all the you know what do they say there's like para, it purges parasites and all sorts of stuff out of your system um and it, you could see how that would be beneficial uh living in an indigenous area where I'm sure you're exposed to more of those things than let's say somebody that's confined to their apartment on fifth Avenue or whatever. So, um, what's your thoughts on that? And did you feel like after you did ayahuasca that maybe there was some cleansing of your actual physical body? 
Yeah, I mean, that's what, God, it just feels like you're throwing up things from like deep within you. I've had weird purging experiences, especially with a boga. I always like cough stuff up. I like cough up phlegm. Um, I also had this one crazy experience on Iboga, like my period started early during the ceremony and it was black, which the practitioner said was old blood. Like your body finds all these ways to purge things out. I totally believe that it's trying to get something out rather than it just causing nausea. Cause for me, it's happened in all these weird different ways. Um, and Cambo, especially like the frog venom, that's like very purgative. And for me, like, yeah, that was a big thing with my Lyme disease after I did Cambo, like you throw up massively on that and it's horrible, but like, I would always feel so much better after that. Um, so yeah, I believe that it's not really known like what is happening with that, but I believe that it's, or maybe sometimes it's energetic purging. It's like getting emotions out of you. But either way, I feel like it's getting something out of you. Why don't you explain Cambo? Because, I mean, I know what it is, but I don't think there's a lot of people that do know what it is from what I've seen people talking about it online and stuff. So why don't you talk about the process and what happens and then the effects? It's horrible. <laughs> um, you <laughs> like, so a person... The practitioner will burn little holes in your skin, which is painful, not that painful. Like I'm very sensitive and I will like yell when they do it, but then I'll be fine. Um, they can do it all over. They typically start in either your arm or your leg. I've gotten it done on my ears, on my back. And then um, once they got like a little indentation in your skin, they take this like it's the secretion of a frog and they put it in the hole and then within a few minutes, you are violently nauseous. Um, I once shit my pants. <laughs> I once fainted. Which like who's is ready awesome. for an orgy? <laughs> <laughs> and it feels awful. And you're like, God, why did I do this? And then you just like projectile vomit into a bucket. And then if you are brave enough, um, you go up. You get more venom put in the little holes. Yeah. You you drink a ton of water for this. That's what makes it really bad is if you're dehydrated. If, if you're hydrated, usually it will come out pretty easy. And then within like 20 minutes or so, you feel great. You feel euphoric. People describe getting visions on it and getting like downloads. I don't get that much of that. I get euphoria. I get some insights. But like physically, you just feel cleansed and you feel like – um you feel like lighter, like mm. something's gotten out of you. And for me, I felt physically healthier each time. Yeah, it's interesting. I think some of these things, and I haven't experienced it, so I can't say, you know, what exactly is yeah, going on. Yeah, that sounds intense. But it, it almost sounds like some of these things, some of these substances, you're putting such a load on your body that that's what you're feeling when you come down, that load being taken off. I mean, you're really, you know... If if it's not a great, if it's not like a, oh, psilocybin where I've got that like lovey, you know, dovey feeling in my gut and I'm about to come up and it's that fuzzy, warm feeling. If it's not that, I think that, um, I mean, I've had intense trips where you come down and you're like relieved. You're like, oh, that was awesome, but I'm not ready to do that again for a long time. Um, so is, do you think it's more like that or do you think it as is like a physical thing where your body's being rid of uh, uh, being expelling these things and that's the the joy or the good feeling that you are talking about yeah it's hard to distinguish isn't it there is certainly an element of relief but I also feel something different um, after Cambo I feel like a definite high um, and I feel like it's not just in the moments after, but in like the weeks after. And for me permanently, I just felt like I had much more energy. Hmm. You like doing that? Are you going to do it again? Ugh, like that is something now that I feel better physically, it's really something I don't have much motivation to do anymore, but I always say that and I always end up back. So maybe someday, but right now I'm pretty good with that. 
Mm-hmm. So do the do you know the history of Cambo? Like, is there like, because you know, like, uh, the ayahuascaros will say, "Oh, the, the the plants taught us, or the plants were the teachers. They helped us discover this." Is there? How did they figure out that burning these holes into your skin and then applying this, you know, frog venom will would get you there? I have no idea. I it comes from the Amazon. I know it's like tribal. I don't know which tribe. Um, and now there's sort of, it's actually the model they use to regulate it is good. It's, so it's legal, and they have like an international association of Cambo practitioners where they, they're trained, they get certified, they're put on this website. So I think it's a good model um, for how psychedelics can be administered. Um, I don't know much about the origins, though. Mm. So uh, just to wrap it up, is there anything else that you want to get out there um, or anything you want to plug or is there anything that you want to talk about before we wrap it up? Not really. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, um, Susanna Weiss, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-W-E-I-S-S. Um, that's about it. Okay. Well, nice. after you uh, come out with your book on psychedelics, definitely send me an email and we'll have you back on the show for sure. Because I think um, obviously we have a lot of authors on and I think that once they have a final product, um, you know, I think we do amazing episodes when somebody has the vision, completes the vision and then is able to talk about their work. I, I would like you to come back after you finish writing that. Thank you. So, uh, but yeah, so check out, uh, Susanna's website. I have the link below the video. Um, we will put this on, you know, obviously it'll be on all formats as usual. And, um, obviously thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and definitely check out her work and her articles. And, um, yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Stay safe out there. Peace. You too.